The reading this morning is taken from 1 John, chapter 4, verses 7 to 21, and can be found in the Church Bible on page 1227. God's love and ours. Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. This is how God showed his love amongst, among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. This is how we know that we live in him and he in us. He has given us his spirit and we have seen and testified that the Father has sent his Son to be the saviour of the world. If anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God, God lives in them and they in God. And so we know and rely on the love God has for us. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. This is how love is made complete among us so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment. In this world, we are like Jesus. There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear. Because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. We love because he first loved us. Whoever claims to love God, yet hates a brother or sister, is a liar. For whoever does not love their brother and sister whom they have seen, cannot love God whom they have not seen. And he has given us this command. Anyone who loves God must also love their brother and sister. This is the word of the Lord. Father God, we just want to pray for Dean as he uh, brings your word to us this morning. We want to thank you for the preparation that he has put into this morning. Lord, would you give us the ears to, to listen and to hear. And may each one of us be blessed with something that we perhaps haven't thought about or heard before as we leave today. Amen. Yeah, uh, what, does God is, what does God is love actually mean? You know, I think this is a kind of a statement that comes out quite a lot. And I think Christians really throw this at each other and perhaps non-Christians as if it really does sum, sum up God. I think it really does sum up God, but I don't think that really helps. And I know Leslie kind of, in her introduction, um, in the morning, um, the start of the service, and I think it's, we take it for granted. I think we don't really think about it very much. And... Um, and in a way, that's why it's quite nice doing sermons sometimes, because you actually kind of have to scratch it and see where it goes and what is it. That's one of the good things about being a sort of a teacher sometimes. It's actually, you learn quite a lot on the job. And um, I think I've kind of learned quite a lot about this. Um, so what's John actually saying? What does he mean by God is love? Well, he's not saying it's an abstract definition. He actually really believes this and actually thinks it's a really important sort of a summary of um, what it actually means. It, it's a summary in the sense of he's been walking with Jesus for many years, and when he wrote this letter, it would have been quite a long time after Jesus was resurrected. But he's also had quite a lot of knowledge about the Old Testament and really the witness that's been sort of taking place over many, many sort of thousands of years. And in a way, that's what, what is God, um, God is love actually means actually means to him. It is a summary of everything that is learned, everything that is read um, in, in, his, in the scriptures and his own kind of personal experience. 
So what does it mean? In, it is the essential nature of God in all his actions and character that God is loving. And I think there's two really quite important things there. One is about his character. That's what he's like in terms of his personality. God is love. But it's also actually in terms of his actions and the things he does. And in many respects, I'm kind of thinking in terms of evidence. It's one thing that's saying God is love. I think actually that needs to be um, witnessed. I think we have to see that. We could say that against for each of us. You know, is Dean loving? Where's the fruit? And where's the actions of that? And I think that's what we kind of need to do. You know, the Lord gives us brains. He wants us to, to, to think about the Bible and, and the words that he has said. And I think he's, he blesses us with intellect. And actually God is there to kind of bear witness I think his character and his actions do stand up as evidence of who he is. So where's the evidence of this? I might end up just reading this. Right. There's a number of scriptures. This probably should have been on the other system. Um, This is how God showed. uh, Actually, I'm going to leave this. I'm just going to read it. It's not working. Actually, before I go on to that... John actually said a couple of other things in his teaching, in his letters. Not that just God was love. He also said that God is both spirit and God is light. So it's not just a kind of a one definition, really, of who God is. What did he mean by God is spirit? Well, actually, Jesus said this. Jesus said this to the lady uh, at the well. And she was trying to, you know, he was saying that he was... um, the living water. And he was asking her sort of questions and saying a couple of things to her and she got a bit embarrassed. So she tried to divert the conversation and say, well, where do we worship him? You worship him in Judah, in Jerusalem. We, we in Samaria. And Jesus said, hang on, none of that. God is spirit. And what does that mean? He is not flesh and blood. He's not like us who's limited in terms of where he is at any one moment. He's omnipresent. And basically, John, or what Jesus said, you worship um, God in spirit and truth. So that's one of the characteristics of God. He also said that God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. What does that mean? He is light and there's no darkness at all in him. By this, John means that God is holy and pure. You know, darkness means perhaps moral perversity and unrighteousness. In fact, it's ungodly because God isn't like that. And so when people kind of say, you know, that we have to be godly, you know, are we resembling some of the characteristics of, of God? God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. So let's come back to what I was just saying before this. So where's the evidence? Well, verse 9 talks about this is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. And then verse 10 says, this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. You know, sometimes we think that we have to love God first before he reciprocates. And that's completely wrong. God is not like that at all. He's always, always the one that that makes the first move. He's a God we're full of initiative. Thank God for that. Thank God that is his character. What a blessing that is to each one, for me, as it is for you. Thank God he, he's not waiting for me to be ship shape and all sorted. <laughs> I've got a long wait, otherwise, and so have we all. God takes the initiative, always. Now, God is light. In him, there's no darkness. 
God is holy, and his holiness demands punishment for our sins. You know, our rebellion for not loving him and loving uh, not loving others. Therefore, God, out of his love, sent his son to make atonement, to be our substitute for our sins. And in this way, God's wrath, that very unpopular word, in and out of church, God's wrath is satisfied and appeased. His wrath for our wrongdoing. And effectively, he turns his gaze away from us in his wrath, and turns to Jesus. That's what he does. God demonstrates his own love for us in this way. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. I absolutely love that piece of scripture. It's in Romans 5, 8. While Dean was still a sinner, Christ died for me, and he also died for you. I don't know if Glenn had actually said this or I'd read this, but it's almost coming back to the Old Testament and all those sort of animal sacrifices. And I think this is really quite important because when we would sin individually and also as a community, we would lead a sheep. In fact, it would be a ram, it would be the ram of God. We would give him the priest, a sheep. And the priest would look at the sheep, not at us. You know, we come to, we, the, the, the Israelites would come to Jerusalem, they would go to the temple, they would bring sheep or a dove or another kind of form of sacrifice and the, pri- and the priest would receive that. And so they're not looking at us. The lamb was the payment for our sin. And that's why John the Baptist, when he saw Jesus, he doesn't actually say this in Luke, he says it in one of the other Gospels. When he first met, well, it wouldn't have been the first time, because the first time would have been in the womb when he leapt. That is in Luke 1. He says, Jesus, here's the Lamb of God who comes to take away the sin of the world. Coming back to that temple sacrifice system. Well, that's what's happening to us. God, out of love, sent his son to be our substitute, the Lamb of God, who takes away our sins and the sins of the world. Now, God's love for sinner involves him identifying himself with our welfare the welfare of his creatures. You know, you and I are creatures. We are human beings. We are created unlike God. Such identification is involved in all love. In fact, it's a test of whether love is genuine enough. So is God's love really genuine? Because if it is, he would have to identify with us in our welfare. He would care for our welfare. Because that's what true love really does. If a father was carefree and unconcerned about his son who was in trouble, we might have raised eyebrows. In fact, if a husband was relaxed and calm while his wife was distressed, then we might think there is not much love in that relationship at all. And the same goes with love, God's love for us. We, his creation, if God, you know, God could just left us and been carefree and unconcerned, but he didn't do that. Actually, he's very mindful and concerned about our welfare. Those who truly love are only happy when those who they care for, are truly happy also. Now think about that in your own lives, the people that you love. Are you happy when they are distressed? Often you'll probably feel emotional. 
There'll be an emotional concern, but there'll probably be a physical one as well. You want them to be happy. We don't want our loved ones, our friends, your husbands and wives, your children to be distressed. Your heart goes out to them. In fact, you want to help them. And you're not truly going to be happy until they're out of trouble. That's the kind of thing that kind of eats you when your friends and your uh, family members, your loved ones are going through tough times. It plays on your mind. Sometimes you can't get to sleep. Even at work, you're thinking about it. We are troubled in heart and spirit. How much more God, who he made. Now God has voluntarily set his love on each one of us and all his human beings, all his creation. Setting his love on us human beings, his creation, God has voluntarily bound up his own final happiness with ours. Wow. I'll just read that again. God has voluntarily bound up his own final happiness with ours. So God won't be truly happy if we're in trouble and if we're distressed because of things that are happening in our lives. How can we believe that? Well, the Bible repeatedly calls God a loving father and a husband to his people. He is a father, a good father, and he is a husband. That sounds like a pretty close relationship to me. That is not a, you know, God is a good husband. He is faithful. You know, again, we can look at that covenant relationship, which is effectively a marriage ceremony between Israel and God. And God is always faithful to those promises, those wedding vows, as it were, that covenant that he made with the, um, the Israelites. So the marriage ceremonies are really important. It's about commitment and love. There's a closeness there. You know, Jesus is the bridegroom, and his church is the bride. Jesus loves his bride very, very much. Even though the bride can be, perhaps not always take her wedding vows, the church, seriously. But Jesus still loves and is pursuing his church. We are his body, he is the head. It therefore follows that from the very nature of this relationship, that God's happiness will not be complete until his beloved ones, us, are finally out of trouble. Now, I'm reading a book at the moment, and I'm sure some of you have already read it. It's a long, it's a, I think it was written about the 70s. It's J.I. Packer's Knowing God. It is truly an amazing book, and it's really worth kind of getting. It's not one you kind of gobble up very quickly. It's got some great chapters in there. And, um, and it really kind of helps us to kind of understand who God is and what is he like. But, but Packer wrote this. God was, per- and it's quite, well, it's, I'm interested in what you think about it. God was perfectly happy before human beings were made. That's you and I. He was perfectly complete in his love. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit were complete in their love. God would also have continued to be complete in his love had he simply destroyed us after we had sinned and rebelled against him. Which I think is quite shocking. But, as it is, He has set his love upon us sinners. And this means that by his own free voluntary choice, what 
will not know perfect and unmixed happiness again until he has brought every one of us, his creation, back into love and fellowship with himself. That's what um, J.I. Packer says, which I think is just an astonishing thing if we think that's true. He goes on to say, how else would you explain the parable of the prodigal son, the lost coin, and the good shepherd, the lost sheep? How else can you explain that? In the same way, these are words of Jesus, in the same way I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of angels of God over one sinner who repents. In fact, that whole, the parable of the prodigal son, you know, the father is God. Look at what the father does and how he rushes over to the wayward son. He runs in a very undignified way. In fact, there's a lot more sort of Jewish kind of references in that, which we don't tend to pick up here um, in, in our, sort of our traditions. But the sacrifice and the shame that he was willing to bear, he ran. Put on some, um, what did he, clothed him, gave him his ring, and there's all sorts of symbolic things there. How is that not love? This is quite shocking. In fact, thinking about where we should watch that video, um, the video of the song Reckless Love, but Josh already had, the Holy Spirit was obviously at work with him this morning. And we just sang that before the sermon. That is reckless love. Bestowing on your, just bestowing your love on people who are not very easy to love and very rarely reciprocate that love back. That is shocking love, stepping down. Allowing your son to die on the cross. This is true love to anyone, to do the best for him he can. This is what God does for those he loves, the best he can. There's no short changing from God. He is, you know, how, our Lord God is omnipotent, which means he's all-powerful. There is nothing he can do. He can do it all. There's nothing that can prevent him from doing what he wants to do. He is God. And he does the best he can. And we may not always understand that. And we might have views about, does he really do that? Does, it, does God fit in with our thinking and our timing? But it's also all-knowing. God is all-powerful and all-knowing. And he does know the best we need. Stepping down to, this is what God did, he stepped down to earth, being born a baby in a manger, and in poverty, lived and experienced what it meant to be a human being, experienced temptation, as we all do, but was without sin, and was crucified on the tree as our replacement and substitute, all of this to reconcile each one of us to himself. God must love us very much to do that. That is not a casual love. So how are we going to respond to our heavenly father, our loving heavenly father? Well, verse 15 and 16 says, if anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the son of God, God lives in, lives in them and they in God. And so we know and rely on the love God has for us. This acknowledgement of Jesus as our substitute in our hearts, on our lips and in our lives, gives us confidence on the day of judgment where we will each give an account of our words and our thoughts and our deeds. I definitely need Jesus at that time. None of us can recon reconcile ourselves to God through our own deeds and kind words. 
God's measure of holiness is way too high. You only have to read the first five books of the Bible to show that the Jews had, the Israelites had an amazing difficult time. They couldn't do it. It's impossible. It is impossible to keep the first five books of the Bible. And the truth is, if we could achieve those things, then there would have been absolutely no point for Jesus. That's really the bottom line there. And often, we can all, to some extent, try and save ourselves. I think we all, including myself, will think our deeds, you know, they, they help a little bit. They can justify us. I was a bit bad over here, but I've done something good over there. I think in our heart of hearts, I think there's a kind of a thing that naturally wants us to, to not really be beholden to anyone. We want to perhaps be our own salvation. I, know, I think we know, we know our theology, but sometimes I think there's a, this is just me at least, there's little bits of me that think it's just a little bit of craving, whether it's a bit of God's glory or it might be a case of you know, but I've done those nice things. I know they don't really matter, but actually, deep inside me, if I was being really truthful, I would say that there's a little bit of temptation there. God would not have needed to step down to earth and to die on that cross if we could have saved ourselves. question, are we relying on God's love and death of Jesus for sorting out our wrongdoing? Are we relying on him? I think most of the time, as I say, I think I definitely know 100% I need Jesus. There's just a little kind of times when I don't feel I need him as much. Putting our faith in Jesus, that his grace and death is sufficient, is really, really important. Because it gives us confidence. That's what verse 17 says. It gives us confidence on the day of judgment. There is no fear in love. But perfect love drives out fear, because fear has to do with punishment. And the one who fears is not made perfect in love. In essence... There is no fear in God's judgment because genuine love confirms salvation. And that's why we can kind of approach when we die or when the second coming comes, when it comes, we can have confidence that Jesus is sufficient. If we rely on our works, I don't think we will ever be confident enough and I'm not convinced the outside world is, because often they think, and I have friends who are like this, who think that their good deeds <clears throat> will go towards their account. But you can never be totally confident. But we can. We can have confidence on that day of judgment because we are relying and trusting in Jesus and recognizing that I need his death and resurrection in my own life. John continues in his letter, Dear friends, since God so loved us, we ought to love one another. This should be our second response to God is love. In fact, he says quite a lot about this in his letter. He says, Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love doesn't know God. Because God is love. And so basically you're saying, if we don't love each other and other people, then we don't know God. How do you feel about that? He's saying we don't really know God if we're not really loving. He's saying loving others is the evidence that we know him. Do you know God? Do you know him in your own life? How well do you know him? Does your life demonstrate that you know God? 
If you do not love, then John is saying that you don't know God very well. What is our state of relationships here at Christ Church? You know, what, is our, what are our individual and corporate relationships like with each other? Do we love each other? What, are, what is the state of our relationships or your relationships with, with your work colleagues and family? Do you love them? This, isn't, this is not always going to be easy. But I don't think it's particularly very easy for God to love us. In fact, I went through this at Christian Union this week, I thought, because I wrote it last weekend as a question. It was interesting what they were saying. They were saying actually hating people is actually exhausting. It's really exhausting. They, said, they also said they thought it was easier to love than to, to like. <laughs> which I thought, again, was very sort of, I thought, very impressed. Yeah, if you hate people, then I think that is absolutely draining. So we somehow need to, with God's help, to love them, almost like to let go of that perhaps poison that's in us. This is what uh, love looks like. Loving people who aren't easy to love. It's easy to love those who love you. Some people are very easy to love. It's the difficult ones which are the problems. And we all know what that is. Okay, every single one of us has experienced that. So why does it matter? Why does loving each other, particularly as a church, as a body, why does it really matter that we love each other and we work to love each other? Because it really speaks to the outside world that Jesus is alive, that he is real. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete. That's verse 12. Since our love has its source in God's love, His love reaches full expression, as in, is made made complete, when we love fellow Christians. And so thus, the God whom no one has ever seen is seen in those who love because God lives in us. So I think for the rest of the world, they are looking at us, and they're looking at our relationships with each other, and with people in our families and work colleagues. And they're looking at how much love we've got. And if we can love people who are difficult to love, then actually that's real evidence that we know God. Now I'm not sure people really think of it in those terms, but actually I think we do. We have an element of that when we look at people, when they're... When, when we are loving towards each other. And reality, if we are wanting to be a church that grows, I'm not pressing common that we're not loving each other, I'm just saying it's really quite important that we do love each other. If we want to be uh, a growing church, and a church with lots of outreach, they are going to come in when they come in. And they're going to be looking at us And are we loving each other? Because if we are loving each other, that doesn't mean we don't get, we don't have arguments and we don't agree with each other, but they're looking at how we deal with that. That is evidence that God is in us and is moving in this place. Love matters, it matters to God. It should matter to us as we are transformed by his presence. So in conclusion, God has chosen, he has freely chosen to pour out his love on each of us here today and all that he has created. 
No one can force him to do that. He chose to do that. God's love is personal. He knows you by name. He knew you before you were born. He breathed life in you. God's love has been costly to him. It cost him his son. God's love should draw us to himself. And it should, it should transform us from the inside out. So I think there's a process involved in this, unfortunately. I think we have to grow in his love. But as we grow to closer to him, we are transformed. So as we approach the altar this morning and receive the bread and wine, let's remember that this is an expression of God's love to you. So as you go up, have a think about this. You know, that's God's yeah, his expression, his gift to you. And our expression of love to him is to receive that in our own lives. So it's a two-way bit. God is stretching out his hands. Effectively, Tim is his representative. You know, he's, the, he's his anointed one for, for Christ church. So God, through Tim, as he gives you the bread. And when you receive the wine, that is a gift. It is a demonstration of God's love for each one of us. As we approach the altar, our response to him, our small response to him is to, to receive that. His bread, the bread and the wine, his body and his blood. So let us make every effort to love one another because God loves us. Amen.